Thanks for coming on such a beautiful day in November. Hard to believe it's in the 70s. Uh, this is week number 11. So uh, homework 7 is due uh, on Monday the 9th. So hopefully you've looked at a lot of those problems. I put the video up Monday, which went over some of them. So uh, today, if you have any more questions, we could, we could talk about some of those problems. Now this centripetal force lab that I had uh, put up there before the test, or right around the time of the test, uh, we're going to talk about that today, and I have that due on Sunday the 8th. If you need a little bit more time, just let me know. And then this week's actual lab, uh, Thursday, it's something called the human arm model, and just for, it's for group A, so we'll meet and do an actual in-person lab on Thursday. Okay, so we've got basically homework 7, 8, 9, 10, so four homeworks to go, a um, couple more labs to go. So um, we're, we're making some good progress. Let me give him this test back. There you are. Okay. So uh, any questions on the test? Maybe that's what we'll do. First thing, we'll talk about the test. And then if you have any homework questions, we could talk about those. And then I want to show you a little bit about this lab. Make sure I added the, the points up correctly also. Let me see. I guess one that I will mention is, uh, and then if you have more questions, we can talk about it. Number uh, three here. Um, this is kind of like the one on the, on the uh, practice test. You throw a ball against the wall, it bounces back. So when it bounces back, you got to make sure that you put the negative sign here for the velocity. Okay. Uh, that was a common mistake on this one. Okay, let me just go through here real quick. Ah, so the free body diagram for this one, this was a lot like the practice test as well. So the free body diagram is uh, weight, um, this force P, at some kind of angle here. And the thing's not moving, so you know that there's gotta be friction back this way. And then we also have uh, the normal force this way. Okay, so the, the one on the practice test was how much is the frictional force? And I called this one PY and this one PX. So the practice test, again, the frictional force was equal to PX and that was P cosine theta. So that, again, that was practice test. That's not really what this one's asking. This one's saying, how big is the normal force? So whatever forces are up, normal force in this case, has to be equal to whatever forces are down. And down we have the weight, but in this case, we also have PY. And then PY turns out to be P sine theta. Okay. All right, excellent. Any questions on that one? All right, let me just go through the rest of it real quick. Uh, number seven here. Which one is bigger, T1, T2? Are they equal to each other? How does it relate to P? I guess the uh, quickest way to do this one is to look at the free body diagram for the 20 Newton mass. So same thing, normal force, weight, T1, and T2. So if you remember, these are all hooked together. It's frictionless. So this is going to be accelerating. So if this is accelerating, there has to be a net force. For there to be a net force, T1's got to be bigger than T2. If they're equal to each other, then there is no net force. But if it's accelerating, we have to have a net force. So it would be something like... Uh, net force, I'll just call this one like M20 or something like that, times the acceleration, T1 minus T2. So that shows you that T1's got to be bigger than T2 for this to actually accelerate. Okay, so that was a little tricky, kind of similar to the practice test, but, but asking something a little bit different. different. Okay, T1. 
bigger than T2. Number eight, I tried to actually make a little bit easier than the practice test, but I think I might have made it harder by trying to make it easier, believe it or not. So this is the same problem. It's just asking uh, what is the momentum, uh, what is the momentum of the two creatures just after the collision. So the initial momentum's equal to the final momentum. The initial momentum is just the mass of the whale times the velocity of the whale. And then afterwards we, ha we did have this, mass of seal, velocity of seal, mass of whale, velocity of whale. You don't really have to, to uh, do any of this detailed stuff. This is what the practice test had. And they actually have the same common velocity afterwards because they're stuck together. So if you want, we could write it like this. And the common velocity is uh, seal plus whale. So this is uh, way more than you actually need to do. We just want the final momentum. So if you could figure out the initial momentum, that's equal to the final momentum. So you don't have to figure out how fast they're going afterwards or anything like that. Just, um, you know, what was the initial momentum? What was the final momentum? Well, it's the same as the initial momentum. So this would be 1,000 kilograms. And then uh, the velocity of the whale was 6. Okay, so 6,000. Okay, very good. Any questions on that one? Okay. And then the other one I'll, I'll just mention here is, uh, this was similar again to the practice test. I think the practice test actually had Q and S or something like that. So a lot of people call this point Q and this point S. In this one, it's actually A and C. It doesn't matter what you call it, really. Um, the practice test, it's the same picture, but on the practice test we were starting from rest here, and then we wanted to know how fast we were going at C. Here you're actually moving at position A. So a beat is moving with 20 meters per second at position A. It's the same concept. Mechanical energy at A is equal to the mechanical energy at C. So this is made up of kinetic plus gravitational potential energy at A. And then that's equal to kinetic energy at C plus gravitational potential energy at C. The practice test, you did not have this term. This one, it, it, you're actually moving at C. So you have to take that into account. And then you know everything except for the speed at C. So, you know, put all the details in and then you can solve for the speed at C. Okay, very good. I didn't get the average on this one. But if I had to guess, I would say it's probably uh, similar to exams in the past, probably like 83 or something like that. I'll let you know. I'll actually calculate it. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have any questions on it? So um, we do have three uh, tests during the semester. This is the second one. So we'll have a third one. I believe it's, I'll have to look at the syllabus, but I think it's the week uh, when we come back from uh, Thanksgiving break. Okay, so it's November. Once November hits, things go really quick, right? We've got a, a break thrown in there, that sort of thing. Okay, good. So maybe we can take a look at the lab then. Okay, so this is bright space. Uh, if you go to content. Uh, labs. So this is the fifth one, actually. So this is, again, the lab that is on centripetal force. Um, it's the one that you've seen for a little bit. You might have not have gone through it yet. It's a FET activity. No big write-up for this one. You just go through, uh, do some calculations, answer some questions. <clears throat> this is actually a video. So um, this is a lab info video. It's just about five minutes long with some more detailed stuff. But here's what the actual lab looks like. Okay, so uh, again, you can just go through, do the calculations, answer the questions, and uh, then just submit it however you want to do this. 
I mean, you could type it out or, uh, you know, print it out, write it out by hand, scan it, however you want to upload it back to me. So um, here's what it looks like. If you hover over this, control click. I think that's supposed to be Newton, maybe. And uh, what you're going to see is this, uh, there's some washers down here. I think they each uh, have a mass of 10 grams. Yeah, each washer is 10 grams. And uh, this is the moving mass. And you can adjust the moving mass. And you can measure the radius here. Change the radius around. Um, this is a little wonky sometimes. Like, for example, in the first part, we have to set this to a certain thing. Radius 200 centimeters, moving mass 25 grams, and 10 washers. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so I've got eight washers. Oh, so it went up to 10 that time. Sometimes it'll skip, like it'll go from eight to 11. You've got to keep going and then come back. Like it doesn't just increment it by one. It's just a little glitch with the program. I think they made it that way, but but if if say you didn't get 10, like I'll see it's just going up by random amounts. 9, 15. Ah. So you might have to click through a couple of times to get 10. Okay, there we go. So I want to calculate the period. So remember the period is the amount of time for this to go around one time. So I could hit uh, start. There's a clock here. And uh, you know, try to get the time for just it going around once. It's better if you go around 10 times and then divide that time by 10, right? That takes out some of the, uh, the random error associated with stopping the clock. Because I want to stop it right where I started. And uh, if I just did it once, it would be hard to, uh, to stop right there. So all of that error would be really piled on that one trip around. So if I can go around 10 times, the, uh, the error is smaller. If you want, you could actually go around 100 times. <laughs> and then you know, get the, divide the time by 100. I'm just going to do 10, though. 10 is fine. OK, so let me start. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, so that looks pretty good. 14.3 uh, seconds. That's for 10 revolutions. So if you divide that by 10, you get 1.43. That's the amount of time for one revolution. That's what the period is, the amount of time for one revolution. OK, so going back to the uh, sheet here. OK, 200 centimeters, 25 grams, 10 washers. So good, 1.43 seconds. Now, looking back, remember what, what the frequency is. It's 1 over the period. How many cycles per second? How many revolutions per second? So that's how you can get the frequency. Now, if you want to get the speed, um, it's a circle. Take the distance around. So if you go around once, that's the circumference of a circle. So 2 pi times the radius, that's the circumference. Divide it by the period, that will give you the speed. Just be careful with the units, because that measuring device is in centimeters. You want the answer here in meters per second. OK? And then uh, from the speed and the radius, you, you could calculate the acceleration that's towards the center. Um, remember, the formula for this is v squared divided by r, right? So once you get the speed, the acceleration towards the center is v squared times r. And then when it's number seven here, use Newton's second law and the centripetal acceleration, which you just found, to calculate the force on the moving mass. So there's two different masses. There's the moving mass. That's the one that's going around. That's the 25 grams. And then you have the hanging mass, which was the 10 washers. OK, so the net force will just be m times a. So here's the a. Uh, the moving mass, whatever the mass of that is, that's the m. So this, this is literally f is equal to ma. And then uh, let's look back at the picture again. So uh, 25 grams, change it into kilograms. Remember, divide by 1,000. And then you can get the net force that's on the moving mass. So whenever you're going in a circle, remember, there has to be a force towards the center. It's the tension here. 
in that string on the moving mass that uh, provides the force towards the center. So that tension, it's the same as this tension because it's the same string. So the tension that you get up there is the same as this tension. So there's another way of calculating the, the tension. You just saw uh, m times a, that was the net force, that's equal to the tension. But that's also equal to the weight of the washer, right? If you did the free body diagram of the washers, the weight of the washer this way, tension in the string that way, um, this weight should be equal to the tension in the string. So you'll do that calculation as well. Now just be careful, it's 10 washers, they're 10 grams each, so that's 100 grams. Change it into uh, to kilograms. Okay, and then you can uh, you know, go, go through the rest of this yourself by changing a few different things around. What's the source of the net force? Well, it's the tension. I don't want to say too much. And then uh, number 12 here, increase the moving mass to 100 grams. So, you know, change that, go through, predict what will happen to the period, that sort of thing. This doesn't mean just guess off the top of your head what will happen to the period. It means use the equations that we have and to come up with what you think will happen to the uh, to the period. So also in bright space, we have this video. Let's see what it looks like actually. Whoops. Better to start low and raise the volume, right? A video of a video. So this is there, it's a resource for you too as, to work on as well. And when it talks about predicting things, you know, go through this video and it'll give you some ideas how to do that. Okay. Excellent. So um, I have this due on Sunday, so hopefully you work on it this week. If you need more time, just let me know. No big deal with that. Okay, I think one person already submitted it. That's fine if you haven't looked at it yet. Um, I think you have all the information to do it now. Okay, great. Any questions about it? Okay. Um, so the next thing I thought we could talk about is any uh, homework seven questions. So homework seven, remember, is due a week, no, it's due on Monday, um, the 9th. Um, I worked out a lot of those problems on, in the video that I put up on Monday, but uh, do you have any, uh, any other questions on it? You might not have had a chance to look at it, so, so if you do, um, send me an email and we can talk about it. Okay. All right, excellent. So then we're up to uh, the next chapter. which is rotational motion. You might say, well, didn't we just do rotational mo motion? We did circular motion, things going in a circle, like a car going around a turn, things like that. Rotational motion are objects spinning on their own axis. So it's similar in some of the similar terms you'll see here, but this is objects spinning on their own axis. Like a, um, if you just had a bike tire and you're spinning it, ah, as you can see there. So um, this chapter is all about the physics of rotating objects. We'll have things like uh, rotational kinematics equations. So we had all the linear ones before, but there's actually rotational ones. One tricky thing about chapter seven is just getting used to the uh, variables. So we'll have angular velocity, but it's omega. Uh, angular acceleration, uh, alpha, uh, that sort of thing. So I think it's helpful when you write down the unit the uh, variables to put the units next to it. It'll give you a, a clue of uh, what it's actually used for. Okay, so here's a uh, roulette wheel going around. Uh, it has a certain kind of angular velocity, angular acceleration. Um, so beginning of the chapter, we'll describe this kind of motion, and then later on, we'll see what actually causes this kind of motion. And what causes an angular acceleration is a net torque. Just like before we had uh, linear acceleration was caused by a net force, we'll have angular acceleration caused by a net torque. Okay. 
Good, so to start something moving, you apply a force. To start something rotating, you have to apply a torque, as the sailor is doing to the wheel there. Okay, a larger torque, larger rotation, or larger uh, angular acceleration. Okay, uh, the girl here is pushing on the outside of a merry-go-round, gradually increasing the rotational uh, rate. So we'll have something just like Newton's law, but it'll be for rotation. So net force was ma. We'll see in this chapter the net torque is something called I times alpha, and I is moment of inertia or rotational inertia. Okay, good. So uh, looking ahead to the lab uh, tomorrow and then for group B the following week, we are going to be balancing torques. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about torque more in the lab as well. Okay, so going back to chapter 6, whenever you went in a circle there had to be a net force towards the center. We had uh, terms like frequency, period, uh, centripetal acceleration. In this chapter we'll have, again, angular velocity, angular acceleration, but we'll go back to these terms like period and frequency, that sort of thing. Okay, good. So uh, rotational motion, object spinning about an axis, and if you notice the uh, picture is more blurry at the edges and then not as blurry towards the center. It's because the points out here are actually going faster because they're further from the edge. So the further you are from the, from the axis, the faster the points are going. But if you think about it like this, if this point goes around once, or this point goes around once, they go through the same angles in the same amount of time. So they have the same angular velocity, but the farther you are from the center, the larger your you know, linear velocity of the kind we had before. So we'll measure uh, angles in radians, actually. And if you're rotating counterclockwise, that's the positive direction through some angle theta here. Okay. So we're used to measuring things in degrees. We'll measure uh, things in. Uh, we'll measure theta in radians. In uh, that's the SI unit. Okay. So if you go around the circle, that's 360 degrees. That's equal to two pi radians. So you might have to convert to to radians. Okay. Good. So you can see from the picture, there's the arc length, there's the, uh, let me do this, here's the arc length S, and then here's the radius R, and there's theta. So thinking back to a, a previous math class you probably had, um, we'll see it in just a minute, but the arc length S is equal to R times theta as long as theta is measured in radians. Okay, so we'll see that in, a, in just a moment. Okay, so this is the actual length that you travel. Theta measured in uh, radians, the radius just in meters. We have this relationship. So S is equal to R times theta, as long as uh, you measure theta in radians there. Okay, so why am I showing you this? Well, we're going to come up with a relationship for a few different things in just a minute. Oops. Okay, so go all the way around. Uh, that's 360 degrees. That's uh, 2 pi radians. Okay, good. That's our conversion factor. One revolution, 360 degrees, uh, all equal to 2 pi. You technically don't have to write radians here. This is a label, not really a unit. So if you just did a 2 pi, that would be fine. But if you thought about radians as a unit, you're you won't go wrong either. Okay. So in linear motion, this goes back to really the first week of class. So we had these uh, motion diagrams. So here's a little delta x, a little another delta x. So this picture over here, we're going faster than we are over here. Uh, we'll have the same thing in this new angular world. So this is the linear world that we're used to, that we've seen all semester. We're going to have the rotational world now. A lot of the things that we did in the linear world, we'll be able to do in the rotational world too. Okay, so angular velocity is uh, delta theta divided by delta t. In the linear world, it was delta x divided by delta t. Here it's delta theta divided by delta t. This is the positive direction, going this way. Okay, 
So this uh, picture over here, the second one, actually has a larger angular velocity. So omega is the uh, symbol for that. So angular velocity omega. So you have less uh, intuition for, for these variables. V for velocity, that makes sense. Angular velocity omega, it's, uh, it's true. It's just you don't have as good of a feel for it, I don't think. So that's why I'm saying I would write down what it means next to it. Like You can start building your formula sheet now for the third test. Put uh, omega, and then uh, the units will be radians per second, and then maybe a little note. That's angular velocity. So don't be afraid to write omega. I mean, it's not w, it's omega. Kind of like this. Well, I don't have a touch screen, so it doesn't look very good. But that's not a w, that's an omega. OK. All right, so that's angular velocity. And it's delta theta divided by delta t. So it's going to be in radians per second. OK, so we want to find the angular velocity of two particles. So let's see. Um, for uniform circular motion, you can use any angular displacement as long as we use the corresponding time interval. So uh, again, you can tell from the first picture here that we're not going as fast as the second picture. So uh, if you go from here all the way over to here, you've gone 90 degrees, right? So you start here and you go all the way up to here at the top, that's 90 degrees. I say 90 degrees because we're used to degrees more than radians, I would say. So 90 degrees is pi over 2 radians. It's a quarter of a, of a circle. So pi over 2 radians in 5 seconds turns out to be uh, 0.314 radians per second. Okay. Now the other one, we went through a complete pi, right, from here to here. 180 degrees um, turns out to be pi. That's on the next screen. So um, 180 is pi, so pi radians divided by 5 seconds. So points, uh, 0.628 radians per second for that one. So it's going faster. Okay, not too bad. you got to start somewhere with this stuff, right? So that's where we're starting. So just like before, we had uh, delta x, velocity times time. Here it's delta theta, if you rearrange the equation, omega times delta t. If you forget any of these, just think back to what we did in the linear world, and then uh, you could write them in terms of the rotational world. Okay, so that's kind of uh, what it looked like before in the linear world that we had before. Now we're just dealing with the rotational world. All right, good. OK, so if you go around a circle one time, you've went uh, you know, 360 degrees, one revolution, or 2 pi radians. That's going around one time. The amount of time to go around once is the period. So omega is 2 pi over the period. Again, you got to think about it. You went around once, that's 2 pi. And uh, divide it by the amount of time called the period, that's what omega actually is. The frequency, just like we had in the previous chapter, is 1 over the period. So uh, you can do a little bit of algebra to, to this formula. And uh, it turns out to be omega is 2 pi and then times the frequency, because the frequency is 1 over the period. OK? Good. So uh, start thinking about th this stuff. You know. Uh, Construct your formula sheet right away, you know. So you have a little thing when you're doing the homework, you can refer to it. Um, it'll be there for the test. Okay, good. So here's an example. Okay, all right, Rick, thank you. The uh, crankshaft in your car engine is turning at 3,000 RPM. So think back to the previous chapter. That is frequency, right? It's just not in SI units we would have, it to have to have it in revolutions per second for it to be an SI uh, unit with frequency. What is the angular speed? Okay, so we've got a lot to work with. Now, angular speed is measured in radians per second. So if we could somehow turn this into radians per second, then we're good to go. 
Okay, so first we'll just put it into uh, to frequency. Sorry, this is a uh, computer is a little strange. So the frequency, forget about this part. The frequency is really given here as 3,000, but it's just not in SI units. So uh, we'll have to turn it into revolutions per second. The minutes here actually cancel out. And 50 revolutions per second, that's the frequency. Now if we want to get the angular speed from the previous uh, 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 slide you, that you saw, it's 2 pi times the frequency. So 2 pi and then times 50 gives you 314. Okay. All right, good. You can think about it like this if you want to. It's uh, 2 pi radians for one revolution. If you're wondering how the units work out, you can think of this as 2 pi radians for one revolution. There's another revolution there. They cancel out if you want to have the units work out. Okay, great. Any questions on that one? All right, good. So there's actually a relationship between uh, V and omega. So this is the angular speed. This is the uh, called the translational speed. This is the speed we're used to, the V here, and it's related to, uh, to omega, omega times R. So let me show you uh, when it says my take on it, what I mean by that. So if, uh, if you just look at a circle here, and there's a couple of spots. Let's just say this is position A, and this is position B. So this distance could be like RB, and then this distance, RA. So RA is the, like the radius out to position A, and RB is the distance out to position B. Okay. So no matter what, if you're at position A or position B and you're rotating this way, so if you rotate around once, you're both going to go through 2 pi radians in the same amount of time. So you have the same angular velocity because you're going through the same angles in the same time. On the other hand, and pretend you're on, this, on the merry-go-round, if you're out here, you go around once, but you go a lot bigger distance, right, if you're at position A. You go all the way this distance in the same amount of time that somebody at B here would go a smaller distance. So the actual velocity at A is bigger than the velocity at B. Okay? So here's, the, here's how the linear variable V, so you know, V would be like this. The linear uh, variable v is related to the angular variable omega, omega times r. So both of those points have the same omegas, but the bigger r is, the bigger v is going to be. Okay? All right, good. Any questions on that idea? Yeah, pretend you're on a merry-go-round and your friend is closer to the axis and you go around, you both go around. 360 degrees, but you've gone a lot bigger distance than your friend has. Okay, good. So let's keep that in mind. And take a look at this one. Oh, but you can't see. Okay, so the diameter, all right, so be careful. They're giving us the diameter of an audio compact disc is 12 centimeters. When the disc is spinning at its maximum rate, which is 540 RPM, okay, good, so that's frequency again, just not in SI units. What is the speed uh, three centimeters from the center and all the way on the edge, six centimeters? Okay, and we want to, uh, to solve this problem. Okay, so let me pull up the document camera here. Okay, so here's the picture. So I'll just call this RA 
three centimeters, so 0 0.03 meters. And then uh, our B, that's all the way on the edge. This was uh, six centimeters or 0 0.06 meters. And uh, we have this 540 revolutions per minute. Okay, that's perfectly good, but it's minutes. So let's make this into one minute, is 60 seconds, and then figure out the actual frequency this way. So nine revolutions per second. Okay, uh, let's see, during one time period, the disc rotates once, etc. What is the speed at this point? Okay. Uh, let's see. Seems like we're missing a piece of information here. Oh no, we, I think we're okay. Okay, good. So uh, we're trying to figure out the actual speed. So this is uh, omega times r just in general. Okay, so um, we don't quite have omega yet. We do have the different r's, right? We can do the uh, position A and position B. So we do know the different r's. What we have to do is get the uh, get omega. We have the frequency, but remember omega is 2 pi times the frequency. And then we'll have actually uh, omega. So let me just do it for the first one here, position B. So omega is 2 pi times, and that's like 2 pi, and again I'm going to write it like this so to really emphasize it. Uh, radians for one revolution, and then I've got 9 revolutions per second the revolutions cancel out. So this turns out to be 18 pi uh, radians per second. So regardless if you're at point A or if you're at point B, omega is the same, right? You go around once, the omega part is going to be the same. The thing that changes is the linear velocity. So when you're at position A, we can get the speed at A. Actually, I think I said I was going to do B. Oh, no, A. Okay. A is the closer one. My previous example, A was farther, but okay. Here, uh, I can get the velocity at A because it's omega times the distance there. So I can do 18 pi radians per second. That's omega. And then times 0.03 meters. So whatever that turns out to be. So I'll leave it like that. You don't have to leave this as pi. You could multiply the pi through if you want to. Okay, so this would be 18 pi radians per second times 0.03. And that would give you the velocity at A. So you can see radius B is twice as large, so the velocity at B is going to be twice as big. So if you're twice as far from the center, you're going twice as fast. Omega, the same, though. Okay, good. Any questions on, on this one? So I'll leave that to you to multiply it out. Now, if you notice, uh, unit-wise, uh, there's the meters per second that we're expecting. You know, what, what's going on with this radians? Remember, it's not really a unit, it's a label. So if I didn't write radians there, that would be fine. So you don't have to write radians here. It's kind of like this. If I'm running across this room, I've got a certain meters per second. You wouldn't say like, uh, say it's 10 meters per second. I wouldn't be that fast. Uh, five meters per second. I'm running at five meters per second. You don't have to say my speed is Dr. Bricker, five meter, or let's see, it would be doc, five meters per second, Dr. Bricker, or something like that. You don't have to throw my label in there. That's really what a radian is. It's just a little reminder. Okay? So it would be five Dr. Bricker's meter per second. You don't have to put the Dr. Bricker part. If you did, you wouldn't be wrong, though, right? Because if it was me, Okay, very nice. So, um, rotation of a rigid body. So just like we had before in the linear world, we were moving boxes around, uh, up, down, up inclines, things like that. Uh, eventually we, we just um, 
use like a dot to represent the whole box because all the particles move together. It's going to be the same idea here. So when it says rigid body, it just means all the molecules are moving together. One part's not going faster than the other for some reason. Okay, so it's not deforming as it, as it moves. This is kind of the disclaimer slide here. Oops. Okay, so before we had translational motion. We didn't even call it translational motion at the time. We just said one-dimensional motion, you know, uh, left, right, up, down, that sort of thing. We even went to two-dimensional motion, but we didn't call it translational motion. Here we are talking about translational motion because now we're going to have rotational motion, so we want to uh, clarify one from the other. So translational motion is just when you're moving this way. Rotational motion is when you're rotating on your own axis. And uh, sometimes there's a combination. Like I could take this pen and throw it through the air. It's rotating on its own axis, but then it's also moving through space. So sometimes you have a combination of both of those. If you ride your bicycle, you have, you have that. The wheel is rotating, but it's also moving forward. So you've got both types. Okay, so the focus of this chapter is the middle one there, just rotating on your own axis. So every point has the same angular velocity, as you know. Um, but if you're farther from the uh, axis of rotation, you have a larger translational speed, a larger v. Ah, here's a voting one we can take a look at. Rashid and Sophia are riding a merry-go-round that is spinning steadily. Sophia is twice as far from the axis as Rashid. OK, so uh, this is Sophia. This is Rashid here. Sophia's angular velocity. So you have to really be careful what they're asking here. Angular velocity is half, same, twice, four times, or you can't say without knowing the actual numbers there. So it's a kind of a voting one. So we want to know is Sophia's angular velocity half, same, twice, four times as much, or you can't say. OK, good. Great. All right, excellent. Good. Excellent, good. So it's the same, right? It's the angular velocity. The omegas are the same. The radians per second are the same. Uh, Sophia is twice as far as Rashid. Sophia's speed, so not angular speed, just regular old speed, translational speed, the kind that we're used to is half as much, same, twice as much, four times as much. So remember, we have to, oh, let me just give you a hint. So we just saw that they had the same omegas, so now you're in a better position to answer. Excellent, good, perfect. All right, nice. Perfect. I think everybody got in. So, oh, there's the uh, formula here. It looks better. Twice as much, right? If R is twice as big, V is going to be twice as big. Okay, so they're directly proportional to each other. Two coins rotate on a turntable. B is twice as far. And uh, is the angular velocity of A twice B? Angular velocity of A equal B, or angular velocity of A is half as much as B. So B is twice as far as A, angular velocity. This is like the final exam of this little section. Right, good. Perfect. All right. Nice. OK. So it's the same, right? Uh, talking about angular velocity. That's the omega. Okay, good. So angular velocity is omega. Regular old translational velocity is, uh, is v. So we can have the uh, angular velocity change as well. Something called angular acceleration. So a change in angular velocity divided by time is the angular velocity. 
And again, this is alpha. So, uh, you know, a nice fun to write alpha. The units of that will be radians per second squared. So if something is spinning this direction, which is the positive direction, and going faster and faster, it's got an angular acceleration. Just like if uh, the linear velocity was getting bigger and bigger, you'd have an, a regular old acceleration. Here you have an angular acceleration. And you can see from these, uh, this kind of like angular motion diagram. Okay. So it's our third acceleration, isn't it? We had uh, translational acceleration, just A. Then we had radial acceleration towards the center. Now we've got angular acceleration. So you've got to keep track of them all. From chapter six, that was the acceleration towards the center. This is a measurement of how fast the angular sp uh, speed is changing. A hint is the units, right? Radians per second squared. So we can look at a couple of different cases. I think the, the top one here is how our brains mostly work. So if you're going uh, in the positive direction, which is counterclockwise, and going faster and faster, that's where alpha is positive. Uh, actually, the left-hand side, this is how our brains work. So again, if you're going uh, in the positive direction faster and faster, that's where alpha is positive. On the other hand, if you're going in the positive direction but slowing down, this is where alpha is negative. These other ones, you usually have to think about uh, the left-hand side first and then uh, do it in comparison to the right-hand side. This is going in the negative direction but going slower and slower, so the acceleration is positive. This one's going in the negative direction, but going faster and faster, so the acceleration is negative. Okay. So again, to me anyway, this is how my brain works. This one and this one make more sense. This one and this one, when you're going in the negative direction and having things happen, uh, we don't usually think like that. But it, as you can see, it's possible. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at this. A high-speed drill rotating counterclockwise, okay, so that's the positive direction, takes uh, 2.5 seconds to speed up to 2,400 RPMs. What is the drill's angular acceleration? Okay, good. And uh, how many revolutions does it take to reach that speed? Um, but for part B, we'll have to look at the next slide first. But we can do part A to begin with. So we got to, again, get used to these different variables that we just got today, really. So it takes 2.5 seconds. And we've got this number to work with, 2400 RPMs. So remember what that is. It's the frequency, just not in SI units. So this is revolutions per minute. We can do one minute, 60 seconds. So this will give us 40 revolutions per second, right? Because the minutes cancel out. The reason I'm doing this is uh, then I can get omega, which is 2 pi times f. So this would be 2 pi, and then I've got 40 um, revolutions per, sorry. Yeah, uh, revolutions per second. This also is just like a label. So I really want you to see how the units, at least in the beginning, work out. So let me kind of back this up for a minute. So omega, this is 2 pi radians for one revolution. Probably you'll end up not doing it like this every time, but I just really want to emphasize where these units are coming from. So this is, uh, this is, just, this is the 2 pi part, radians per revolution. And then you got 40 revolutions per second, just so you see how these units work out. You don't have to write this every time, I'm just doing it so you can get a better feel for it, maybe. So this is 80 pi radians per second. Okay, so like we did before, we can call this a later angular velocity. So I'm calling it uh, 
in the notation of the book, omega final. And then we start from rest, that's what we're assuming. This is zero. So this would be like we start from rest and you get up to some kind of speed. It's just this is a different kind of speed, it's angular speed. And we do know how much time we have here. So then uh, alpha, the angular acceleration, delta omega divided by the amount of time. So omega final minus omega initial divided by the time. And we start from rest. Okay, so this would be uh, 80 pi radians per second minus zero, so I'm not going to write that, divided by two and a half seconds. Okay, so 160 over five, so that's five point something. So whatever this turns out to be. I forgot my calculator at home. But you can, you can see radians per second squared. So whatever that number is. Uh, okay, good. So again, I'll leave it to you to plug that in your calculator. And then how many revolutions does it go through? So really, how many, uh, how many delta thetas do we have? And it says, look at the next slide. Okay, good. Let's see. There we go. So we'll come back to part B. So we've got all these kinematics equations. So the ones on the uh, on the left-hand side, you're familiar with, right? These are all what we did for a while. Velocity delta x over delta t, acceleration delta v over delta t. Um, here's some equations. We had all the different kinematics equations. They're not all actually listed here, but um, we had a whole bunch of kin kinematics equations, if you remember. V final was V initial plus AT. We have all of them in the rotational world as well. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll write those down for you, actually. We could use the uh, rotational ones to uh, solve a lot of different things. So let me uh, write these down for you. Yeah, let's build a little page here. So instead of delta x, we have delta theta. That's in ra radians. We have angular velocity. velocity radians per second, angular velocity, alpha, radians per second squared, um, angular acceleration. And then we have got all the rotational uh, kinematics equations. Omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha times t, omega, uh, omega final squared, is equal to omega initial squared plus two alpha delta theta. And then finally delta theta omega initial t plus one half alpha t squared. So if you're wondering like, how do I know all these? I don't remember these per se, I know the linear ones. And then uh, instead of V, I write omega instead of a, I write alpha. Instead of delta x, I write delta theta. So they're all, these are all the linear ones, just rewritten in terms of rotation. Okay? When I took a similar class a long time ago, it seemed like we did these forever, like all these rotational kinematics equations for like weeks and weeks. I'm sure it wasn't. It just seemed like that. So, so uh, on the homework, I just put a few of these problems on. We're not going to go back through and do a whole bunch of kinematics equations again, but we'll do a few of these. And they are there, so you, you see them. So luckily we have already uh, kind of experienced these in the linear world. So this is not completely new. The new part is that we're dealing with the rotational world now. Okay, so you just have to get used to that. Okay, so let me, uh, while you're looking at this, go back here.
Okay, just a second. I just have to put homework eight up real quick so we can look at some of those questions. Just about got it. Four and six. And finally. This is actually homework uh, eight, which I just put up. It's not due until like a week from Monday, so there's plenty of time. But we can look at a couple of these. And again, I really think that uh, just getting used to what these things are is the first battle with this stuff. So we got a, a record ro uh, rotates on a turntable at 33 RPM. So everybody knows what a record player is, I think, maybe. Vinyl is becoming popular again. So there's 33s, there's 45s, there's actually 78s. I've got a record player at home. Um, so 33s are uh, slower than 45s. I think 33s are actually albums, aren't they? Does anybody know? It's okay if you don't. I, I'm pretty sure that's what a 33. 45s are the small ones that have like one or two songs on them. 78s are actually big, but they only have one or two songs also. The, it's just the way that they were recorded. Okay. Good. So I used to always ask, do you know what vinyl is? But I think it's becoming popular. Um, younger people to you won't know what CDs are probably. You, you all know what CDs are, I think. But they're, phased, they're being phased out, right? The reason that these uh, vinyl things have sort of come back is just the sound that they have. It's got a different, like, warmer type sound. At least that's what people say. Okay, so be prepared for people not to know what CDs are when you're, when you're describing something to them. Okay, anyway, back to this. We've got 33 RPMs. Ah, RPM, that's a clue. That's the frequency, just not in the correct units. We want to know what is the angular speed in radians per second. Okay, so we've, we really got to just convert RPMs to radians per second. And then uh, what is the period? Ah, okay, that shouldn't be too bad. So if you know the frequency, the period is 1 over the frequency. All right, let's look at this one. All right, awesome. So uh, 33 revolutions per minute. That's the frequency, just not in SI units. So again, um, revolutions per minute, yep. So uh, one minute, 60 seconds. So this is really the frequency here. 33 divided by 60. So a little bit more than, than a half. Let me actually see if I can locate a calculator. Uh, 33 divided by 60. So 0.55. That's how many revolutions you do per second. So you don't quite even go around once per second, right? Like after a second, you've only gone a little bit more than halfway around. Okay, so uh, um, I think we want to know the period in part B. Yeah, what's the period? So the period is 1 over the frequency. So 1 divided by 0.55. This is revolutions per second, so this will give us seconds per revolution. So I've got to take the inverse of that. 